on the internet last week was yesterday. And someone posted on the Telegram feed main group that they're that they're also giving away the banana. So I'm like, should I get the banana back? <laughs> 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 because I lost I lost really good stitches. I don't have any ego in it. I see. Is it a is it a rare emulator? Yeah, it's a really solid. I mean, it's just not like. Thank you. 
Hi, Dr. Tran, how are you? I think your microphone's muted. You're right, it was muted. Hi, Dr. <laughs> Sanders, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Yeah, happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thanks for, uh, thanks for doing this. Yeah. Thank you for uh, giving a presentation to my class yesterday. Of course, yeah. My mic muted because I'm eating, I'm eating cookies right now, so I didn't want my like sound to like come up on the mic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Oh, I need I need to allow you to uh, share screen. Okay. We back. I'm gonna go put my cat away. Okay. See a couple of familiar names on the participants list. Chris and Mitch. Good to see you here. How's everybody doing? Good. Uh, are you enabling chat or not? Um, this is Dr. Tran's Zoom meeting. So I believe, yeah, it looks like chat is open. Oh yeah, I have the, the chat on. Yep. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll read the chat. So if you if you get any questions from the chat, I'll I'll forward, I'll, uh, I'll I'll tell them to you. Okay. Good. Yeah, because I won't be able to see that. When yeah. I'll, I'll I'll keep an eye on it. Great. Thank you. Put the finishing touches on my presentation yesterday evening. <laughs> nice. So you're uh, you're way ahead of schedule then. <laughs> right. <laughs> Plenty of time to spare. Right. So this is EGME four ten, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Good. There's lots of FEA in my presentation. Nice. Yeah. yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, your presentation was awesome yesterday. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I still have some things I'd like to talk to you about, maybe yeah. later this evening at the virtual faculty outing. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I didn't know you could lump other circuit elements. I thought it was just uh, capacitance. Oh yeah, yeah. You can you can use a bunch of them. Each each circuit element represents something different. Um, so yeah, there's the resistors represent something, capacitors represent something, inductors. So mostly mostly people just use resistors and capacitors, uh, just because those are the two main effects that you would uh, you want to capture. But every other thing has its place too. So current models velocity. Mm -hmm. And uh, pressure was voltage. Yep. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Oh, we use diodes too, because diodes are basically valves, because they just allow um, current in one direction, basically. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm recording this also. It, it's gonna be on my, uh, it's, I, I recorded locally, so I'll send you the video file afterwards if you want it. Okay, cool. Okay, so it's four o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so welcome everybody um, to our very last class session together. So, um, uh, so, uh, so just like you know, I've been hyping up for the last two weeks. It, today we have Dr. Sanders here, um, and he's and he's uh, he's here to tell us about uh, his past research interests. So um, I'm sure a lot of you know Dr. Sanders. So I think you know no more introductions really that necessary. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to him. Great, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So yeah, I think a lot of people. Um, know me already. For those of you that don't, I'm Dr. Sanders. I've uh, been here for a few years now. This is my third year. And uh, my research is in the field of solid mechanics, fracture mechanics, 
and clean energy. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about the research that I've been doing lately. Um, I started this research in graduate school and a couple of my current graduate students that literally just defended their thesis like two weeks ago uh, helped me finish. Um, so we'll be talking about some of their work today as well. Um, to give you some motivation for my research, it's all about clean energy. So replacing um, fossil fuels with carbon neutral energy sources. And the thing is that in the future, all of these carbon neutral energy conversion systems, they're being designed to operate at extremely high temperatures. So you know from thermodynamics, right, the, uh, the ideal uh, upper limit on your thermal efficiency is given by the Carnot efficiency. And it, it's one minus T cold over T hot, right? So the, the higher T hot is, the higher your upper limit on efficiency is. So to give you an example, the very high temperature reactor is so named because it's being designed to operate at temperatures exceeding 800 degrees. Current reactors are operating at 300 degrees. So that tells you um, just how much of a difference that is. And at those really high temperatures, metals undergo a type of deformation called creep and creep rupture is expected to be the primary failure mechanism. And design codes like the um, ASME boiler and pressure vessel code, they set strict limits on the amount of creep strain that can accumulate during the lifetime of a component. Typically it's 1%. So you don't want the creep strain to exceed 1% during the entire lifetime of a component, which could be up to 60 years or more. So that provides a, a challenge for the engineers that are designing these systems they have to make sure that they're gonna last for 60 plus years. So because creep isn't usually covered in the mechanical engineering curriculum, I'd like to start with just a little bit of background about that. Creep is, it's a lot like plasticity. So it's non-elastic deformation and it occurs at high temperatures. So we're talking um, above about half the melting temperature of the material. And what happens is, you know, at room temperature, if you apply a fixed stress to a specimen, you're gonna get a fixed amount of strain, right? Hooke's law, or after yielding, you get the plastic part of the stress strain curve. But the point is that a fixed sigma results in a fixed epsilon. That's not true at high temperatures. So at high temperatures, if you apply a fixed stress, the strain is gonna to continue to accumulate over time. And that's what, that's what creep is. So here you can see, um, I think I can even get a little laser pointer here. Um, here you can see what's called a creep curve. So it's strain versus time, constant stress, constant temperature. And you can see that schematically it occurs in three stages. We call it primary creep, secondary creep, and tertiary creep. In secondary creep, the strain rate tends to level out and become constant. Um, and so that's what defines secondary creep. Primary creep is this initial part, sometimes called transient creep. And then the transition between them is characterized by a time scale, which we call tau. So some, ex some materials exhibit primary creep, some don't. So for some materials, you'll just see the curve kind of extend linearly initially without any primary creep part there. And that's gonna be important. We're gonna talk about that later on. So in secondary creep, empirically, if you do a bunch of these experiments, you know, different experiments at different stresses, if you plot the strain rate in secondary creep, this slope right here, if you plot that versus sigma, the applied stress, um, and you use log log scale, you tend to see linear uh, data, the data that display a linear relationship. and that tells you that it's a power law relationship, right? So the creep strain rate in secondary creep is given by a power law of the applied stress and the exponent of that power law is in fact the slope of this log log plot right here. So that's an important parameter that kind of characterizes creep. Um, that's in secondary creep. So this equation right here does not have primary creep, it also doesn't have tertiary creep. 
Tertiary creep is more to do with damage. It's not really a material response. It's the accumulation of damage at the micro scale. So we typically don't include tertiary creep in the material model itself, but we might try to model damage in the geometry. So this only works for secondary creep. When primary creep is present, strain accumulates more rapidly, as you can see here. And a lot of creep models, they actually neglect primary creep. Usually it's for the sake of simplicity. And so a constant theme throughout this presentation is gonna be asking whether that's justified, whether that's a justified um, approximation. So that's creep. By the way, I didn't say this, but if you have any questions, please feel free to um, ask them at any time. Yeah, about the, um, the neglect of primary creep. So in industry, when you're looking up certain values for things, constants, material, uh, materials, properties, whatnot, if it's structural, is that already factored in, you think? Is the primary creep already factored in? Right. Um, not if you're, if you're looking at this model right here, no. This model cannot reproduce primary creep. So um, often, you, all, all you'll get is this data right here, and this doesn't include primary creep either. Um, if, you, if you dig in, you can find the original creep curves. I'm gonna show you some creep curves in a second for actual materials, and you can kind of get a sense for how prevalent primary creep is. But for the most part, primary creep is kind of, um, it's an emergent, area of research. It hasn't been investigated that much um, to date. Did that answer the question? Yeah, I did, thanks. Okay, great. So here, here you can see example data. Um, this is alloy 230, it's a nickel-based alloy, and this is a chrome moly steel. And you can see that um, alloy 230, it it doesn't really exhibit a whole lot of primary creep. The strain rate is pretty much constant throughout these creep curves, um, not a whole lot of primary creep. On the other hand, the chromoly steel, you can really see that primary creep stage at the beginning. So these two materials, um, they, they're representative. This material is representative of a material that does not exhibit primary creep, and this is representative of materials that do exhibit primary creep. So if we compare the two, we can kind of see the effect that primary creep has. All right, so the first um, project I'm going to tell you about has to do with stress concentrations at crack tips. So you know that at sharp changes in geometries, you get stress concentrations, and that's also true at the tip of a crack. Um, in fact, stresses can get really large at crack tips. And the stress field in the vicinity of the crack tip determines when that crack will propagate and therefore when a cracked component is going to rupture. So a natural question that engineers ask is what does that stress field look like in front of the crack tip? And particularly when you're designing a high temperature component, what does that stress field look like at high temperatures? So to measure this, um, to do a fracture experiment, a classical, a classical fracture experiment is the compact tension test. So you get a compact tension specimen, which is shown here. And it's fabricated, it's got a notch in the middle. You apply equal and opposite forces at these two um, points right here. And initially what you want, you want to get a, a, a pre-crack. So you do cyclic loading um, to get a small fatigue crack at the tip of the notch. And then you remove the load and then you do the actual experiment that you're trying to do. So you apply your test load, it can be monotonic. In other words, F can increase in time. It can also be cyclic where F increases and decreases. And you measure various quantities until the specimen ruptures. So the applied force is what determines the stress field ahead of the crack tip. It completely determines it, this force here. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn the tables here. Um, who, wants to, who wants to tell me, how do we measure stress? You're all engineers, you're, you're probably seniors at this point. So you, you, you can all tell me how we measure stress. <laughs> 
Anybody? One of the uh, test lab where we used the little material that we put on there, and then it would take the electrical value. But I remember that during the tensile to stress test. Yeah, what did you do with the tensile test? Do you remember? I think we uh, added a sensor and we measured the, res the, the resistance across the material as it was being elastic, uh, sort of like strained. Right. Yeah, it, that's a strain gauge, right? Right, yeah, strain gauge. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So that's actually measuring strain, not stress. Oh, okay. How do we measure stress? What is stress? Stress is uh, force per unit area. Exactly, right? So it's F over A. So the way we measure it, in a tensile test, we apply a known force. We can measure the cross-sectional area in the specimen, and then we divide them. We can also measure strain. So if you use a strain gauge, you can measure strain, and you can use Hooke's law to get the stress. The problem with that is it only works up to the elastic limit. It's not going to work after the specimen yields. So in fact, it's actually impossible to measure stress directly. That's true of the tensile test specimen. It's even more true if you have multi-axial loading like a compact tension test. So how can we possibly measure the stresses at any point within the compact tension specimen? Because you know that at each point, there are actually six independent stress components. How can we possibly measure those? Well, the answer is we can't. We have to rely on models coupled with finite element analysis. So you, you just spent a whole semester learning about FEA, and you know that it's used in industry as a proxy when testing is impractical. If it's too expensive to fabricate a model of the thing or a full-scale representation, you simulate it in using finite element analysis, and then you don't have to uh, pay for the fabrication and the, the destructive testing. It's also used in research as a proxy when measurement is impossible. We, we can't possibly measure the stress, all the stresses at every point. And so we use finite element analysis to get an idea of what those stresses would be. So I'm gonna present just a little bit of background about the work that's been done to characterize the stress field in front of a crack tip. And then I'll show you some of my results that I've obtained. So back in 1957, um, Williams decided to analyze a semi-infinite crack in an infinite material. So the material is infinite, and the crack occupies um, the negative x-axis, basically. And they, Williams solved the governing equations of solid mechanics, the governing equations of elasticity, for this problem, subject to a remotely applied stress field and obtained what's called the singular elastic solution. It's called singular because it blows up at the tip of the crack. At r equals zero, the stress field actually goes to infinity. So it actually goes like one over square root of r. So the farther you go out, the less it gets, and it goes like one over root r. It's also found to be proportional to a constant, which we call k1. And that's called the stress intensity factor. So if you look at any um, experiments on fracture, they're going to be talking about the stress intensity factor, the stress intensity factor. All that is is a constant that appears in the singular elastic solution. It's essentially an integration constant. So that's where that comes from. Um, and in practice, it, we know that you know, infinity doesn't occur in in the real world, right? The stress does not go to infinity at the tip of the crack. Um, so the singular elastic solution is only really accurate within an annulus ahead of the crack tip. So not too close, but, but not too far either. Closer to the crack tip, the material is going to yield, right? Um, before the stress becomes infinite, the material is going to yield, and you're going to deal with inelastic behavior anyway. 
So the singular elastic solution would not be accurate right up against the crack tip. All right, so that's for an elastic material. If you've got a material that is creeping, and specifically with secondary creep, so no primary creep, no tertiary creep, just secondary creep, Riedel and Rice obtained another solution. It's called the RR solution after them. So this is valid within an annulus ahead of the crack tip, but it's closer than the singular elastic solution is. So the RR solution, it's characterized by a time dependent parameter C of T. And as time goes on, the stress in front of the crack actually relaxes. So it becomes less, it decreases as time goes on. And as time goes to infinity, it, this parameter approaches steady state, um, which we call C star. The spatial singularity goes like one over R to the one over N plus one. That N is the creep exponent that I showed you in the power law, okay? So it's still singular, but it's less singular than the singular elastic solution. That exponent is actually um, less than the, the one half, the root r. And again, um, it's only accurate within an annulus. It's, it's not accurate right up against the crack tip, um, but it gives you a sense for the field that's closer than the singular elastic solution gives you. And what happens is this region um, of creep, as time goes on, it starts to grow. So um, this region starts to grow and eventually you get extensive creep, the, the entire specimen's creeping for sufficiently large times. And that is characterized by a time scale TRR. So TRR is the time at which um, it transitions from small scale creep to extensive creep. Okay. So that's fine if you're only interested in secondary creep. Um, but if you're interested in the effect of primary creep, which I am, you have to use a different model. You have to use a different material model. And to do that, a lot of models, they're called unified creep plasticity models. Um, without getting into too much of the detail, they incorporate what's called a kinematic hardening variable. Sometimes people call it um, back stress. Some people call it flow stress. And so essentially you just replace the stress tensor sigma with sigma minus alpha in the constitutive law. And what happens is this alpha, it's not a constant, it changes over time. And as it changes, that simulates the transition from primary to secondary creep. Now these models aren't available in commercial finite element programs. You have to program, program them yourself. And so what I did was um, when I was a graduate student, I found a model that had been proposed at Oak Ridge National Lab in the 70s, and I implemented it in Abacus using what's called a UMAT, a user-defined material subroutine. So anytime you're working with a material model that doesn't come uh, prepackaged with the software, you have to do it yourself, and it's, it's a bear, it's a, it's a pain. Uh, this particular UMAT that we wrote, um, me and my, uh, my advisor and, um, the postdoc that was in my group, uh, it's over a thousand lines of code. So that gives you some idea as to the amount of effort that it takes to do this. But that's what we did. And once we had that UMAT, we um, could use Abacus to simulate a compact tension test where the material undergoes primary and secondary creep. So this is what we want to simulate, this scenario right here. Um, do you notice anything special about this geometry? Anybody want to comment on the, the geometry? It's symmetrical. Yes, very good. The geometry is symmetric and the applied loads are symmetric. And so what that means is anytime you see symmetry um, when you're doing finite element analysis, that is um, a huge advantage. Always, always, always take advantage of symmetry um, because it saves computation time. It saves loads of computation time. Instead of simulating the entire specimen, we only have to simulate part of it, okay? So this is the part of the specimen that we ended up simulating. And it's a simplified model, right? 
We didn't include the notch because the notch doesn't actually contribute to the stress field in the vicinity of the crack tip. Uh, we also didn't include these notches either uh, because again, what happens over here does not actually affect what happens near the crack tip. So we've got a very simple geometry that we want to um, simulate here. Um, because this is a symmetry plane, we constrain it in the vertical direction. So it's a, it's a plane of mirror symmetry. It can't move up or down. So that's what our mesh looks like. Um, we want to have a highly resolved mesh near the crack tip because of those high stress concentrations. If you don't use um, small elements near the crack tip, you're going to get inaccurate results, as I'm sure you know um, from this course. And the material, as I said, was that unified pre-plasticity model that we implemented in the UMAP. And so once you, once you set all this up, you can run the software and it's going to tell you all of the field quantities in your specimen. In particular, you can look at the stress field ahead of the crack tip. So this is um, your equivalent stress contours. This is what that singularity looks like in front of the crack tip. You can see it's very large um, in the vicinity. Um, we're not just interested in equivalent stress, we're interested in the opening stress. So the opening stress, that's sigma yy. If this is the y direction, sigma yy would be that component of the stress tensor. So I'm going to show you opening stress distributions along the symmetry plane. Okay, so theta equals zero here. Um, so I'm plotting the opening stress versus r, the radial distance from the tip of the crack. And I'm doing this for two materials, those two materials that I showed you earlier, alloy 230, which remember did not exhibit a whole lot of primary creep, and the chrome moly steel, which did exhibit primary creep. And you can see that the behavior of these two materials is quite different. I've shown you here, um, this is the singular elastic solution. The colored dashed lines are the RR solution, and the solid lines are the numerical solution. So this material, alloy 230, it doesn't exhibit a lot of primary creep. And so as a result of that, the RR solution is still accurate. This is the annulus in which the RR solution is accurate. And then this is the annulus in which the singular elastic solution is accurate. So this is not too different from what you would get if you neglected the primary creep response altogether. If you just modeled it as secondary creep, this is not too different from what you would get. This, on the other hand, is very different. You can see that while over here, you had that annulus where the RR solution was valid. Here, you don't get that annulus until much later on, much larger times. Um, I should mention the colors are different times. Um, red is the first time, and then purple is the, the last time. So clearly, primary creep is having a significant effect on the stress field ahead of that crack in the chrome moly steel. Um, it would not be a good idea to neglect primary creep in chrome moly steel. And one of the things we found, we were actually able to define a dimensionless number, which we called Xi, the capital Greek letter Xi. And it's really just a ratio of two time scales. We've got tau, which is the time to secondary creep, and we've got TRR, which was the time to extensive creep of the whole specimen. And the ratio between those two is given here. It's dimensionless. When it's really small, it means that primary creep is negligible. So for these simulations right here, psi was 0 0.001, really, really, really small. Um, over here, it was 15, so very large. So that was one of the things that we were able to do. We were able to define a new dimensionless quantity that characterizes how important primary creep is to a compact tension specimen, to a crack tip. And this was actually just recently published earlier this year in the International Journal of Solids and Structures. So this is hot off the press. Any questions about this slide? <laughs> 
Uh, Professor Sanders, actually, oh, go a ahead. Quick, yeah, quick question. Um, not necessarily about this slide, but just about like uh, like some of the notation. Mm -hmm. um, like I think it was in a previous slide, but it was describing a stress, and then it had components of uh, I J. Um, yeah, I forget what is that referring to again. So yeah. that is initial notation. So the I and the J stand for X, Y, and Z. Okay. So you can have sigma XX, sigma XY, sigma oh. X. Yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, so it's it's this this thing right here. Any other questions before I move on? Okay. So some takeaways from, from this project um, are that primary creep, when it is present, does significantly affect the stress field ahead of a crack tip. So obviously you want to be aware of that when you're designing components um, the last 60 years, you don't want to neglect primary creep because that can really affect behavior um, of the stress field, and therefore the, the, the time that it takes for the thing to rupture. And of course, we define this new dimensionless number that characterizes the significance of primary creep. If you want to know whether primary creep is significant or not, you can always calculate this number. Um, if it's much less than one, you can get away without modeling primary creep. When it's much greater than one, you really need to account for primary creep. Regardless of the extent of primary creep, we say that the stress field is characterized by the stress intensity factor. Um, that's the parameter from the singular elastic solution under small scale creep. And then for large scale creep, um, you want to use C star, that um, steady state value of C of T. That's going to characterize the stress field um, under extensive creep conditions. Okay, so that was one project. Um, a second project, um, that was kind of what I just showed you was very macroscopic, right? Um, we were looking at a compact tension specimen, a macroscopic crack. Uh, we're also interested in the micro scale um, causes of fracture and rupture. And we know, um, this is not anything new, this is well known, um, that what causes fracture typically in, in metals at high temperatures are voids. Voids are just gaps. They're spaces of empty material that form along grain boundaries. So here you can see all of these black um, blobs here. Those are voids. And um, voids um, tend to grow, right? They, they, um, they nucleate and then they grow and then they link together they form microscopic cracks, and then those microscopic cracks link together to form macroscopic cracks. And many commonly used lifetime estimates, you know, if you're designing something and you ask yourself, how long is this going to last under this stress state, many commonly used estimates are based on simulations of how quickly voids grow. Um, the faster voids grow, um, the shorter the lifetime is going to be, and vice versa. So one of the things we're interested in here, how quickly do voids grow at high temperatures? Um, the, the question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay, is it voids or cracks that are synonymous with the term dislocation? Neither. Um, a dislocation is much, much smaller than a void. It's a defect in the actual crystal lattice. So, um, Actually, dislocations do play an important role in this process. Dislocations um, contribute to the growth of voids at, a, at an atomic level. Wow, okay, thanks. Yeah. So, um, in fact, plastic deformation in general is caused by dislocation motion. And creep is, is one example of plastic deformation. So, at the atomic level, creep is being brought about through dislocations. Yeah, good question. So generally speaking, um, you can kind of 
categorize void growth, if the voids maintain their original shape as they grow, if it's you know isotropic, it's the same in all directions, we call that quasi-equilibrium growth. Um, if it only grows along the grain boundary, we call it crack-like growth. And so one of the things I'm gonna show you, we're actually gonna simulate void growth um, with finite element analysis, and we're gonna de determine conditions under which you get quasi-equilibrium and crack-like void growth. Um, so to give you some background here, um, there are three mechanisms that contribute to void growth. This is at a macroscopic level. So I just told you that at a microscopic level, you've got dislocation motion going on. We're not really interested in um, that level of resolution here. We're looking at it um, on, the, on the microscopic level. Um, and there are three me mechanisms that contribute to void growth. One is creep of the surrounding material. So if you apply a stress, the material is gonna creep, it's gonna deform and that is gonna cause the void to grow. Another mechanism is diffusion of matter. So you can actually get atoms migrating along the void surface and along the grain boundary, and carry, that carries material away from the void, and that also contributes to the growth of the void. So there's been a lot of work done in modeling and simulating this void growth process, again, uh, because the idea is that the faster voids grow, the sooner rupture is going to occur. So void growth is kind of a proxy for component lifetime. Now, in the 70s, there were researchers that um, modeled void growth in the presence of surface diffusion and grain boundary diffusion, but they neglected creep. They considered the grains to be rigid. Um, later on in the 80s, uh, Needleman and Rice they started to do more um, detailed simulations and they included creep of the surrounding material and uh, grain boundary diffusion, but they didn't model the surface diffusion process. So a natural question is, what happens? Um, can, we, can we model this process? Can we simulate this process in the presence of all three of these acting at the same time? Until recently, nobody had done that. Again, oh, again, you've got symmetry, right? So the grain boundary um, provides a symmetry plane, and um, assuming that the external loads are symmetric as well, um, you can also consider this to be a symmetry plane as well. <clears throat> so for the purposes of simulation, we don't have to simulate the entire uh, unit cell here, we just have to consider one fourth of it. So I'm gonna show you what two of my graduate students did. Um, they simulated void growth in the presence of all three of these mechanisms acting simultaneously, which had never been done before. Um, this is um, Nilufar Jamshidi and Negar Jamshidi. They just graduated um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so that was very exciting. So this is the geometry that they considered. Again, it's one fourth of that unit cell due to symmetry. And essentially you've got three ingredients. You've got the unified creep plasticity that occurs within the actual material. You've got diffusion of matter along the void surface. Um, so that's described by Fick's law here. And then you've also got diffusion of matter along the grain boundary, which is also described by Fick's law. You've got um, a remotely applied stress S acting on this surface up here and then you've got um, boundary conditions over here because it's a symmetry plane. It's not allowed to translate in the horizontal direction. We don't actually constrain the grain boundary. And the reason for that is that as matter is um, carried away from the void surface, it gets depleted onto the grain boundary. And so the grain boundary does actually deform during this process. We don't constrain it um, like we would a usual um, symmetry plane. Now, here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. Um, this is why this hadn't been done for you know 70 years. Is that commercial finite element programs? They can't do matter diffusion. 
So if you want to simulate that process, you have to write custom finite element code. In this case, the code we used was over 7,000 lines long. So for those of you um, in, this, in this class, this is why Dr. Tran insisted on teaching you the theory behind finite element analysis and not just how to use ANSYS. Um, sometimes the commercial programs are not enough and you have to write your own code. So this is the mesh that we used. Again, the elements are smaller um, the closer that you get to the void um, because of the need for resolution in the vicinity of the void. All right, so let me show you some results. Um, my students, they did it for actually two different models. So we're, we are considering the chrome molly steel, although we've non-dimensionalized our results so that they apply to any material. And um, Nilufar actually considered just secondary creep. Um, the other student, Negar, she included primary and secondary creep, okay? So let me show you Nilufar's results first. Um, it turns out that there are three dimensionless numbers that characterize the void growth. And Nilufar ran over 200 simulations. Not all of them are represented here, um, but she ran over 200 simulations. And for each one, she categorized it as quasi-equilibrium, crack-like, or if it was somewhere in between, if it was ambiguous, um, she called it dynamic void growth. In other words, it's kind of like uh, the transition between crack-like and quasi-equilibrium. So each one of these data points represents a single simulation with a certain combination of um, parameters. So here you can see that based on these three different parameters, by the way, this one was uh, fixed at 200 for this particular set of simulations. So you can see that depending on the values of these parameters, you get different kinds of void growth. Okay, so let me show you, um, for example, this simulation right here. Um, you can see that um, over times, so this is the initial shape of the void. And then at subsequent times, the void starts to grow. And it's really only growing in the X direction along the grain boundary. It's not growing in the Y direction. So that is definitely crack-like void growth. <clears throat> if you increase this surface diffusion length, um, you can see an example of quasi-equilibrium void growth. So again, this is the initial void. And as time goes on, it starts to grow and it's growing proportionally in both the X and the Y directions. So that's an example of quasi-equilibrium void growth. In between, you see something that is kind of neither nor, right? Um, it's not quite quasi-equilibrium void growth because you get more growth along the X direction than in the Y direction. It's not quite crack-like void growth because you do see some growth in the Y direction. So for these cases, when it, whenever it was ambiguous, we just decided to call it, you know, in between and not try to categorize it as one or the other. So again, this was for um, secondary creep. For primary creep, if you include primary creep in the model, it turns out, and this was really unexpected and surprising, it turns out that the shape of the void is the exact same. So if you run one simulation with model parameters using just secondary creep, power law creep model, you see quasi equilibrium, you might see quasi equilibrium void growth. If you use the same parameters and you use the more general model that includes primary creep, the shape is identical. The only difference is the times that have passed, right? So here, you can see the times that have passed, um, 0 0.15, 0 0.75, 1.5. Here, um, you get the same amount of growth, but at a much lower time. So when you include primary creep in your material model, the void grows much faster than it does if you only include secondary creep. In other words, if you neglect primary creep, you're gonna underestimate how quickly that void grows. In fact, here, 
it's 83 times faster with primary creep than without primary creep. So again, that was that was Negar, Negar's work. Um, they just graduated, they defended a few weeks ago. So again, this is like, this is not hot off the press because it, it hasn't even been in the press yet. <laughs> so some takeaways from that. The shape of a growing void is determined by three dimensionless numbers. Um, depending on the values of these quantities determines whether it's quasi-equilibrium or crack-like. And primary creep, when it is present, greatly affects the rate at which the voids grow. And so while many common creep models neglect primary creep, doing so can lead you to underestimate component lifetimes if you're basing it on the rate of void growth. Um, some general final thoughts, okay? Um, so clean energy will require very high temperatures to increase that thermal efficiency. And it's important for engineers to be aware of primary creep and its effects when designing high temperature components. If you neglect primary creep when it is present, um, you're gonna underestimate, um, you're gonna overestimate component lifetimes. Uh, oh, did I, is that wrong? Yes, sorry, there's a typo here. Um, you can overestimate component lifetimes when you neglect primary creep. Whoopsie, I'm gonna fix that right now. Sorry, hold on one second here. This is what happens when you, when you leave it to the last minute and you work on your presentation the night before. This is the beauty of uh, Zoom presentations. You can make yeah. correct corrections on the fly. <laughs> That's right. Okay, there we go. That's much better. Neglecting primary creep can lead you to overestimate component lifetimes. So um, FEA can help us gain a better understanding of these effects, right? These are, these are model simulations. They're not exact, um, but they do give us an understanding of what primary creep does when it is present and what, what it can cost you when you neglect it. And then finally, a very general comment um, that applies to any finite element analysis simulation is always exploit the symmetry, right? Um, in both of these projects that I've shown you, there was um, symmetry. And if you exploit that symmetry, you're gonna cut down on your computation time significantly. So with that, I will open the floor up to any questions that you might have. On the, the last slide, I noticed that in the diagram, you have a label that I think in yellow, I think it says hoop direction. Yeah. Uh, is this a cylinder? This is an internally pressurized tube. Okay, so it is kind of like from 430, some of the things that we mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's, a, it's an internally pressurized tube. It's a pressure vessel, yeah. And what you're seeing here, this is a cross section of the wall thickness. So here's the inner surface, and then somewhere out here is the, the outer surface. Got it, okay, yep. thanks. Any other questions? Dr. Sanders, I know you talked about using symmetry a lot, but can you talk about some of the other uh, finite element modeling decisions, like how many elements did you have and what element shape and like what element order did you use? Yeah, absolutely. So, oops, went too far. So here, um, we did run a convergence study. Um, you always want to do a convergence study. Um, anytime you do a finite element simulation, I'm sure you talked about that um, in this class with Dr. Tran. Um, you want to decrease the element size until um, things stop changing, right? Um, and that's exactly what we did. And that's how we got to this level of resolution down here. Um, these were plain strain elements. 
And if I recall correctly, um, I think they had eight nodes. So they were eight noted um, isoparametric plane strain elements in Abacus that we used here. And for the void growth simulations, the custom code, um, I believe these were also eight nodes. I remember there being um, nodes at the corners and also nodes at the midpoints. Um, and again, um, we did a convergence study um, to figure out that this was um, sufficient um, in order to resolve everything that was going on. Obviously, um, the void is not as uh, concentrated, the stress isn't as concentrated uh, as it is with the crack tip, so you don't need as much resolution here. So that was, um, that is the, um, the elements that we used. What about your computational cost? Did you have to run this on like a supercomputer or? Good question. Yeah, we didn't need a supercomputer for this particular simulation. Um, we were using um, just regular Dell desktops in my lab here at Cal State Fullerton. Yeah, Dr. Tran's research is much more computationally expensive than mine is. Yeah, so we got a, a question from the chat. So I think you uh, you answered half of it already, um, but then uh, Eric also wants to know, uh, what would you do, um, what else could you have done to reduce the simulation time if they were taking too long? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know what else we could have done because there's a limit, right? Um, you can't, sacrifice um, mesh resolution if you want accurate results and there is no further symmetry reduction that you could do um, to these problems. So I'm not sure that there was anything else to be done, but those are the main things, right? So symmetry, um, the less you have to simulate, the faster it's gonna go. And then you want to start with a coarse mesh and refine it incrementally until you achieve convergence. You don't want to use too fine a mesh because that's also going to be expensive. Given the, uh, you know where the, the crack is going to start uh, and you're kind of concerned with how it's going to propagate, is there a way to localize the refinement? Yes. Are you talking about the void problem in particular or the other one? Uh, yeah, the void problem. I mean, like just okay. in terms of the mesh. So we didn't actually simulate propagation as much as void growth, right? So I guess you could consider this to be a kind of crack propagation, or you could consider it to be just the growth of that void. So we didn't, for example, do any um, element separation at the grain boundary. We didn't have it physically rupture. We just had the void grow over time. But there are, there are methods that you can use. Um, for example, if, if, the, um, if the stress gets too high in a certain element, you can actually have it detach, and now it's no longer um, it's no longer bound here. Um, it can actually just uh, move freely. So that's what you would do if you if you wanted to actually simulate that process even further. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's really difficult though. Um, because that's gonna be very, very dependent on the size of your elements, right? If, you, if you've got one element that's, for example, you know, this long and it separates, that's gonna be very different from an element that's only half as long and it separates. So that requires um, a lot of care in element selection.
Dr. Sanders, so in, in our class, we've been using just ANSYS, um, mostly just because ANSYS gives a nice free version and we have them licensed already. Uh, but in your mm -hmm. project, you use Abacus. Uh, so can you comment a bit on how you would, you know, what is that decision process like? How do you choose one software over the other um, for a specific application? Um, that's, a, that's a good point. So as far as I know, Abacus and ANSYS are very similar in terms of um, fidelity. Where I went to graduate school, Abacus was the preferred software. Um, I think the reason for that is that my advisor was more familiar with the source code for Abacus than for ANSYS. Um, Abacus was developed by researchers at Brown University, um, and Brown was um, very involved in the initial development of finite element analysis um, theory. So um, people kind of trust Abacus. They know that it's working the way it should. Um, that's not to say that ANSYS doesn't work the way it should. It's just that um, that was kind of the preferred software at the University of Illinois where I was doing my research. And then Chris commented in the chat that said Abacus also has a student version and it's, and it's free and he's downloaded already and he's, uh, he's used it. So, so both, both. Oh, really? Both okay. Are good. Mm -hmm. Nice. Maybe we can look at incorporating both Abacus and ANSYS into the curriculum at some point. Yeah, I think that would be, I think that'd be cool. These are some great questions. Are there any other questions? We've got some time here. Well, if there are no more questions, I'm, I'm out of presentation. So maybe we can, um, it can let you go a little bit early, let you off the hook early. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Yeah, thank you again for for presenting. This was this was really cool. I think a very different perspective than I think than I've been giving for, for this semester. So I'm glad everyone was able to see what you've been working on. Yeah, and and same same to you with my 430 class. I feel like you know our research is very different, but also very complementary. Um, so it's good to see both sides of that. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, thank you very much again, and, and thank you very much, everyone, for, for tuning in. Uh, so this is our last uh, session together. Um, so once again, thank you, everyone, for, uh, for a great class. Uh, I know this semester was, all, was you know, really challenging. I think especially for us, using the software has been, I think, really challenging for a lot of you who have troubles with on your laptop. So I just want to say thank you, everyone, for persevering, and thank you, everyone, for making this class as, you know, as, as best as it could be. So um, our, remember, our project's going to be due on Tuesday, May 19th. Uh, so that's the week after finals. So, um, so if you have any more questions on that, I'll I'll be available as I can for the next week. Um, and if not, um, you know, have a great summer. All right. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.